Ashbury Neighborhood Council General Meeting. Uh, I do appreciate you coming. Today is the second in a series of three discussing the sharing economy here in San Francisco and really state and nationwide and how it impacts uh, various folks, especially those of us here in San Francisco. Um, before we get into uh, tonight's meeting, we do have a couple of announcements. Real quickly, do want to pass along and Forgive me. My name is James Sword. I'm the 2015 president of the Haight-Ashbury Neighborhood Council. So thanks again for coming. It should be a, it's a good summer, I think. Um, so a week and a half ago, uh, the District 5 requests for, for support financially from the city was um, put into a, a meeting with Mayor Lee, as well as Supervisor Breed, a handful of other organizations, local organizations, and we requested funding for about five different um, issues, specifically the, the two at the top of the list were the Panhandle project, a three and a half million dollar project that we expect the city to pay for base funded. Um, that's based on their numbers to help fix the Panhandle, correct uh, irrigation, make it safer. If you've walked on the pedestrian pathway, you know exactly um, what we we're talking about. And actually tomorrow, some of us will be meeting with Phil Ginsburg. Uh, the superintendent of Park and Rec uh, to talk about some of those items as well. And then the other item we really pushed um, in, in support of the Haight-Ashbury Merchants Association and some of the others is funding for street lighting um, that was supposed to be in the hate realm, among other things. In fact, it was the most popular item in the hate realm and the first thing to be cut by the city and the MTA. So we'll see what happens. Uh, fiscal year ends at the end of June. Got our fingers crossed, but uh, that's a little update on that. And Tess has a, a couple of announcements, and then we'll get started. Hi, I'm Tess Wellborn, uh, treasurer for the Haight-Ashbury Neighborhood Council. And I'd like to tell you about two rallies and a meeting coming up. On Saturday, there's going to be a rally be, uh, from 12 to 2 in the Fillmore, because you may have noticed in the Fillmore, there are a lot of empty storefronts. This is a kind of a legacy of redevelopment, in my opinion. And people say that, well, black businesses don't want to meet, uh, form in the Fillmore and stuff like that. The rally is to, set, to support black businesses being able to get places to rent. They have, Yoshi's uh, is the, the location, the former lo Yoshi's, for this rally. And it's just kind of a, a joke that, these, that a big corporation can keep these storefronts empty for decades. So if you can, on Saturday between 12 and 2, stop over by Yoshi's, which was uh, on Fillmore near Eddy. And on Monday, there's going to be a rally at City Hall on the Pope Street side, and then people going into the Land Use Committee to talk about the short-term rental issues, uh, which we'll be hearing a lot more tonight. Um, and finally, <coughs> D5 Action, which is a neighborhood group, well, it's actually a pan-district group, is meeting uh, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. at Coffee to the People, Masonic, and Hate. And if you're interested in issues that, that come up to span District 5, do come to our meetings. Thank you. All right, so we'll move forward with our, our main meeting. Tonight we're gonna focus again on uh, the regulations and, and short term, one quick announcement. Um, okay. I want to respond to an article in the newsletter. When would be the best time for me to do that? Or comment or? I guess any time. Uh, if you prefer to send it via email, I can give you my email or just in general, probably after the meeting. Um, I, it was something I wanted to bring up sort of to, like, to the group. Uh, best to bring up, we can discuss after the meeting, the board meets next week, and we can bring it up the next week. So, to open up a dialogue with, yeah. with the membership about it. All right. Talk to me after the meeting. Okay. We'll, we'll get all right. that going. Okay. Um, all right. So, the, the main meeting, again, is focusing on short-term rentals. We have a, a panel tonight. We have Calvin Welch, who is board member and also uh, the land use chair and affordable housing guru for the Haight-Ashbury Neighborhood Council. We have Tim Redman, the former editor of the Bay Guardian and current uh, manager of 48hills.org online. And we also have Dale Carlson, who is of Share Better San Francisco, which is another organization looking at um, the shared economy and short-term rentals here in San Francisco. 
So real quickly, uh, until the city passed a law in February, it was illegal to rent out a unit in San Francisco for less than 30 days. Uh, in the Haight-Ashbury alone, there were 284 listings on Airbnb, of course the most famous, but you might also be familiar with VRBO, and uh, I'm sure soon there will be more coming out. Uh, you 60, mean infamous? In, infamous, yes. Thank you. 62% uh, of the listings in the Haight are entire units. Basically that means that 62% of the 284, so about 150 or so, are basically units taken off the rental market for the rest of us. So I'm gonna hand that off to the, the panel. They're gonna discuss a little more in depth, talk about some statistics and the impact of San Francisco. So thank you. 12 slides and then you guys. Okay. It's okay to sit down. My name is Calvin Welch. Uh, thanks uh, for coming. Um, and virtually every statistic that I'm going to give you today, uh, uh, this evening, can be disputed. And it can be disputed because in, in a significant way, the whole short-term tourist rental market is kind of shrouded uh, in mystery because although it's part of the sharing economy, what is characteristic of the sharing economy is the companies don't share the data, and they certainly don't share the data with local governments that generally are tasked uh, to enforce laws that affect their business models. This is true with uh, uh, the uh, uh, ride sharing, with uh, uh, shared transportation entities, and it is most especially true with quote unquote uh, uh, home sharing. Uh, so, uh, as you'll see, one of the big issues that we're going to be dealing with in, in the city is how much data should Airbnb, should uh, host a web-based home uh, rental tourist, uh, short-term rental uh, facilities, share their data with the city in order to be able to uh, uh, fairly regulate uh, the, the activity. So all of the data is estimates, it's based upon data scrapes. I'm gonna introduce you to a particularly creative website uh, um, uh, that uh, you can go and take a look at yourself and rant and rave or uh, support or, or oppose uh, the data. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, not a lot of data, the data does, that does exist is kind of informal data, it comes from uh, software programs that actually strip data. It turns out that many of the home sharing uh, listings do have embedded in it uh, GPS uh, uh, data. That's why you see in some of the maps uh, units being in the middle of Golden Gate Park or uh, uh, in, the, in the ocean. Uh, so um, uh, data, which will be controversial tonight, I'm sure, uh, is part of the issue. Uh, uh, so one of the ironies of the sharing economy is big data and the big data holders don't want to share the data. They'll sell you the data, but they don't want to share it. So uh, as best as this is uh, from our planning department's uh, uh, executive summary uh, uh, late this month, uh, this was uh, uh, their best uh, attempt uh, uh, and uh, the numbers don't exist, but it is, holy, holy, um, it is um, about 62% of uh, the units in San Francisco are full, on uh, uh, Airbnb site are uh, full units, uh, about 27%, uh, 28%, uh, are uh, shared rooms and the rest are uh, spare bedrooms. So the narrative that this is about people's shared bedroom isn't quite the case. The reality is it's full units. And 72% of uh, San Francisco hosts income comes from renting entire units. Uh, 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 only about 27% of uh, the revenue generated on Airbnb comes from a private room, running a, a private room. Generally, it is assumed with the owner present. 
and only about 1% of the income is generated from that famous spare bedroom, that shared room. Um, about, sorry you can't, the, the red on black doesn't come across, about 15.4% of San Francisco's Airbnb listed units are owned by people who live outside of San Francisco. And as you can see by the map, outside of the United States. 15% uh, of uh, uh, the listings are uh, uh, hosted by non-San Franciscans. And a lot of this data comes from dark and difficult. I just can't stand it anymore. Uh, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, website uh, that has the most extensive, uh, and this all comes from perusing uh, the listings, uh, the Airbnb site. Darkanddifficult.com uh, at World Press. It's worth uh, taking a look at. The fellow's got a sense of humor as well. Uh, this is one of his uh, maps, uh, non-San Francisco hosts, uh, red line, San Francisco hosts, uh, the uh, uh, blue line. This is a, a very interesting one, and let me see if I can... Uh, Bruce, uh, how do I enlarge this? Um, Can I enlarge the... What this uh, purports to show, based upon an analysis of the website over time, is that in May of 2015, that is this month, 7.5% of the hosts uh, uh, rent 18% of... Excuse me? Okay. Rent 18% of the total units listed on Airbnb. So a very real phenomenon in the, the uh, STR, the, the short-term rental existence, uh, uh, is what we might call commercial users. People who uh, um, uh, have multiple listings. Uh, one famous one that we have reported uh, uh, to the Department of City Planning over how many months ago, Neil, did you? It was in August. Uh, last August. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. A woman who's got a web page and a Facebook page that uh, uh, lists her Airbnb rentals, bragging she had got tw tw uh, 12 units, that this is a business for her, uh, um, a very lovely photograph of a woman, um, uh, and she doesn't live in any of them, and uh, is very proud of the fact. 36% of San Francisco hosts' income comes from multiple listings. 64% uh, come from a single listing. But 36% in San Francisco uh, comes from uh, multiple listings. Uh, this is, uh, uh, folks may know that uh, state law requires counties to uh, have what is called a housing element, uh, a housing plan to meet uh, the housing needs of their existing population by income and their projected population growth. Uh, it is called the housing element. It's required by state law. The yellow line are the number of units that are supposed to be affordable to people earning 80% of median or below based upon folks' income in San Francisco, and the projected growth of the workforce and population uh, through uh, uh, 2014. Uh, of that uh, 12,124 affordable units, we built, in fact, 4,978 affordable units. And we, during that same seven-year period, 07 to 14, we lost 3,276 rent controlled units through conversions, Ellis Act evictions, uh, and so on. And full unit Airbnb and VRBO uh, listed units during that same period was 6,788 units. So between short-term rentals and the loss of rent controlled units, we were minus 9,000 affordable units, and we built about 5,000, some 7,000 short 
of the projected goal. Full units listed on Airbnb and VRBO in December of 2014 in San Francisco totaled 6,239 units. Full units, not bedrooms, not shared rooms, but full units. The net total new units built in San Francisco in 2013 and 2014, and folks will understand we are in the midst of a market rate housing boom in San Francisco. We are building units at a rate that was only equaled in the 1970s during urban renewal when they were mainly financed by the federal government. We have never seen such a production of market rate units in the history of San Francisco. And in 2013 and 2014, both years, we produced in this historically uh, uh, unique rate, 5,844 net new, new units. But on December of 2014, uh, uh, full units listed on Airbnb and VRBO was 6,239, uh, uh, 400 units more. What, what period does that cover? Is that only? VRBO? For the, the listed units, is that for the full year, or is that for the That was on December. That was one day. <clears throat> yeah, one month. In December, okay. there were that many units listed combined on Airbnb and VRBO okay. as full units. Uh, the loss of rent-controlled units, uh, as I've said, uh, 3,200 uh, rent-controlled units uh, uh, have uh, uh, been lost uh, uh, between 2007 and 2014. In the Haight-Ashbury, which is uh, more than two-thirds rental, um, the, um, I'm sorry, this is, uh, I've got a, a little bit of a problem here in terms of, uh, full measure. But uh, what the graphic showed, if I can go back, Previous here, I got it. I need another previous. <laughs> Sorry, folks, it's not my machine. One more. Okay. About, uh, unfortunately, the, the uh, frame is cut off. In the heat ash Washington Edition, about 33%, one-third, of all of the vacant units, uh, uh, vacancy for rent, uh, are, uh, uh, are filled by Airbnb full units. That is to say, the number of what the uh, legislative and budget analyst refers to in his report, which just came out today, I urge people to take a look at it. Uh, uh, he creates uh, an, an analytical uh, entity known as commercial entire unit listings. Um, and his uh, numbers are that there are 122 such units in the 8 Ashbury uh, when there were 260 vacant units in 2013. Uh, in the intermission, uh, it's about, it's almost, uh, uh, it's 199 Airbnb commercial units uh, out of 483 vacant units. A significant portion of rental units uh, in uh, um, uh, San Francisco, and especially uh, the highly impact neighborhoods, the Castro, the Haight-Ashbury, the Mission, uh, DuBose Triangle, um, that are highly impacted by uh, short-term rentals uh, make up a significant portion of the vacancy rate. That is to say it would be 25 to 30 percent more vacant units were not the uh, large number of full-time uh, Airbnb units. There is also, according to the report uh, uh, by the BLA, a number of neighborhoods with the most commercial hosts also saw the most evictions in 2014, according to the city's rent board data. Uh, 
Uh, this uh, exhibit shows that about 12% uh, 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 um, uh, an eviction rate of about 12% in the inner uh, uh, mission, about 8% here in the hate, are attributed to, according to the analysis of the BLA, the large number of commercial hosts active in those neighborhoods. The BLA report ends by saying uh, um, uh, that uh, the City Board of Supervisors should consider the following actions, enact legislation requiring hosting platforms to provide host addresses, booking information on a quarterly basis for enforcement purposes, enact legislation requiring hosting platforms only to list units that are registered with the city, and enact legislation limiting the number of unhosted nights allowed uh, in uh, um, the city. So, in conclusion, the, the, the data that uh, I have presented to you shows that short-term rentals are, significant, are significantly in higher units. They are centralized in the high-tenancy generally upper middle income neighborhoods in the city have an, an impact on the vacancy rate in those units are increasing in terms of numbers of units that are held by a single person, multiple listings uh, uh, in Airbnb. So the reality seems to be greatly different than the narrative uh, of Airbnb and other short term levels, that these are basically spare bedrooms and empty nesters and that they really don't have an impact uh, on the housing uh, market. So uh, with that uh, database, let me uh, present uh, our two panelists, Jim Redmond, uh, publisher, editor, and chief bottle washer. Uh, uh, I the bottle Gilles, that I and, and he's, he's brought a bottle to watch. Mm -hmm. And Dale Carlson from Share Better San Francisco, a, camp, a coalition uh, of some 30 uh, labor and community-based groups that are proposing to do an initiative measure uh, this November. So uh, let me uh, uh, start with a question to, to Tim. Tim, you've been around this town long enough to know <clears throat> that um, in San Francisco, money walks and yes. bullshit talks and the other way around. Do you see any relationship in terms of the role of uh, uh, Airbnb and sharing economy businesses, Uber, playing any significant role in, in raising funds and picking candidates in San Francisco? Do they well, have a political impact? I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, I think we've seen that very clearly. I think that, you know, one of the conclusions that the budget analyst report reaches, they don't reach it in so many words, but I reached it after reading it, is that the legislation by David Chu last year that was supposed to take care of the Airbnb problem has been an absolute, complete, utter 100% failure, right? Um, there are fewer than 300 people out of the somewhere between six and 10,000 Airbnb listings that are actually registered by the city, right? Very, very tiny number. Basically, everyone is ignoring it, right? And it's not having the impact it was supposed to have. So why did this go through the Board of Supervisors? Well, at the time, there were a lot of people, including staff members at the city planning department, who said, this is never gonna work. Whatever you think about it philosophically, it's not enforceable. You can't make this thing work this way. And yet, it went through the Board of Supervisors and the mayor signed it. Now, the mayor's best buddy in politics, as we all know now, is Ron Conway. Ron is very close to Ed Lee, um, has raised a lot of money for Ed Lee, and in fact, has made it very clear that anyone who runs against Ed Lee will run into the Ron Conway independent expenditure buzzsaw, and he will raise whatever money is necessary, including from his personal billions. Well, actually, one of his assistants said to me once, you can't call Ron Conway a billionaire. He's not a billionaire. And I said, well, how much is he worth? Well, I don't know, 900 something million. <laughs> so some of that I probably Robert spent, Earth. what? Yeah. Um, so, but he's close to a billion dollars. He's obviously willing to put up his own personal money to do this. That has had a tremendous impact. I mean, we all saw what happened in the Campos Chu race, where David Campos got walloped by a Ron Conway independent expenditure that went after him every single possible way and attacked him. And I think a lot of people have looked at that and said, whoa, 
why would I cross this guy? I, in fact, know for a fact that a very strong candidate for mayor decided not to run because he didn't want to happen to him what happened to David Campos, i.e. getting the crap beat out of him by Ron Conway and his unlimited money. So that's definitely had an impact. Chu got probably five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000, including the IE from Ron Conway, who, by the way, is a big investor in Airbnb. This is, he has a financial interest. He has a stake in this thing, right? If Airbnb, he's got a lot of money put into Airbnb. If regulators around the country were to do what the city of Santa Monica just did, which is to basically ban short-term rentals. The city of Santa Monica basically said, you can't do this anymore. If they were able to enforce this, and if that spread around, Airbnb's business model in the United States of America would significantly collapse. It wouldn't mean that, and I think this is an important distinction, it wouldn't mean that a senior citizen who's got an extra bedroom in their house and rents it out every once in a while to bring in some extra money, no one's really complaining about that, and that wouldn't stop. But the wholesale use of taking entire apartments and houses off the rental market and using them instead for Airbnb would come to an end. And that's a lot of their money. Ron Conway would lose money on that investment. So he has a personal financial stake in this. And as people in business do who have personal financial stakes in the outcome of regulation, he has made sure to spend a lot of money in local politics. And I think it's two ways. I think part of it is giving money to people who he likes. But I think the second part of it is creating this message. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with Ron Conway and, and the tech corporations that he represents, or he will go after you. So I think it's had a very significant impact. I think that's one of the reasons that this went through the Board of Supervisors, despite the fact that, as I say, a lot of people said, whether you like home sharing, you don't like home sharing, this legislation is never going to work. Well, I think the question that's on certainly my mind is, how is it in the city that uh, it was illegal until uh, October 2014 to rent a unit for less than 30 days in every residential unit in San Francisco. How is it that we got five, six, seven, eight thousand units rented for less than 30 days? It's a really, it's an interesting question, Calvin, and it, it plays into, I think, this model of how the sharing economy and the tech industry in general operates in San Francisco. You notice that old saying, it's, it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And the way these folks have operated for a long time is, don't ask permission to do something that's illegal, just go ahead and do it. Remember uh, Willie Brown's column in the Chronicle about two months ago where he was talking about the central subway or something and he said, you never ask the public, you never have a public hearing before you do something like that. Just dig a giant hole in the ground and start digging and by the time anybody figures out what's going on, it's too late, right? So this was kind of the model and we saw it with the tech shuttle buses that we fondly call the Google buses where they basically came into San Francisco and started parking in the Muni stops. How were they allowed to do that? Well, when they started, I actually went around and asked parking control officers in the mission, how come you're not ticketing that guy? And they'd say, well, we're not supposed to. Well, why aren't you supposed to? We're not supposed to. Okay, so using the miracle of the California Public Records Act and the San Francisco Sunshine Ordinance, I was able to get some internal emails from the MPA and the mayor's office and various political consultants saying, hey, don't ticket our guys, we have a handshake agreement with City Hall that we're not gonna do this, that we're not gonna ticket them, that we're gonna let this happen, all right? Again, the mayor, very fond of the tech industry, somewhere quietly somebody said, just let it go. I think the same thing happened with Airbnb. I think the planning department, I haven't found the smoking gun memo on this, possibly because the office of Mayor Ed Lee took a cue from his predecessor, Willie Brown, who once said, you know what the E stands for in email? Evidence. evidence. So they don't email anything. So there's no memos, there's no paper on this, but I think what clearly happened is someone from the mayor's office called the director of city planning and said, don't enforce this stuff, just let it go. It's a local company. Remember Ed Lee, you said Airbnb is a local company. It was founded by local people. And oh, by the way, it's financed by my best buddy, Ron Conway, who helped put me in office and is keeping me there. So let's not mess with them. Let's just let it go. And then what happens is it gets big enough that suddenly, it's a huge industry in San Francisco, and suddenly, now there's a huge amount of constituency for it. There's a lot of people who are making a lot of money off of this. Some of them, as I say, people who are just occasionally renting out a room in their house when they're out of town, but in a lot of cases, people who are making a lot of money from doing this. And now you've got a whole constituency that has been very well organized by Airbnb to go down to City Hall and say, don't mess with us. 
So I think it was a phenomenal failure of enforcement, and I don't think unintentional. I think that that's basically right. It's the same way, why didn't we do anything about the Google buses? Why was it that for about four years, people were allowed to operate illegal taxi cabs in the city with no permission whatsoever? Uber and Lyft, the entire business model was based on violating local laws. To operate a taxi cab in San Francisco, you have to have a taxi cab medallion. These guys went and just started doing it, again, with no permission. The director of the taxi commission was going absolutely crazy, Christine Hayashi. She was driving her nuts that this was happening, but essentially she was told not to do anything about it. And it was just kind of, let's let this happen, and then eventually we'll try to find a way to backwards go around and wrangle something and, and make it legal, which is what they've done. It's, it's remarkable. Let me just take one second, if it's okay. It, you know, because I know that the, um, there's a lot of people who are using Airbnb who really are, just like there's a lot of, there are a lot of small landlords in San Francisco who are nice to their tenants. And every time somebody tries to do some tenant protection thing, a few of them get dragged out to say, oh my God, you're gonna hurt the small landlord. There are people who are using short-term rentals in the way that I don't think any of us would object to, which is occasionally renting out a room in your house to somebody to bring in some extra cash. But here's how it's really happening in San Francisco. Right, I was at a press conference today where I met this woman named Susan. Susan lived for 10 years in an apartment on 18th Street, near 18th and Church. A few years ago, her landlord applied for a permit to convert to a condo. Now, in San Francisco, if you have an apartment you want to convert, or in this case, three units, you want to convert into condos, the rules say that you have to live there, first of all, in one of them. You have to live in one of the units, and you have to offer the other units to the existing tenants if they want to buy it after you convert them to condos. So this guy files a conversion permit, despite the fact that, by all accounts, he was living in the East Bay with his wife and kids, never once lived in the unit. City planning never checked. DBI never checked. He got the condo conversion permit, and because it is legal to do so, with a he evicted her. So this woman, in 2014, was thrown out of her home of 10 years. She's a woman who works with autistic children in San Francisco. She's thrown out of her home. She's got no place to go. She crashes with the next door neighbor, who she's become friends with. And she looks out the door, and every day, tourists are coming in with their suitcases into her former apartment. It's not a condo. He's not living there. He didn't sell it to a San Francisco family who's living there. Right? This woman was evicted, apparently, and according to a lawsuit that she's filed, this woman was evicted so that the landlord could turn a housing unit that was rented out in San Francisco into a full-time hotel room. And that's what he's done. She was paying $1,700 a month. He's now getting $250 a night for renting this out, and it's booked most nights. You can see that the difference is about a factor of five. He's making about five times as much rent as she was paying. Right? But this is not an occasional rental unit. This is somebody who has taken an apartment, a rental unit, off the market and turned it into a hotel room. And that's what's happening all over the city, and that's what's got a lot of people worried. That's the real thing that's happening here. And that's what, I mean, there are so many things that are allegedly illegal about what happened here that have not been enforced. But, you know, under the Chu legislation, this continues because there is no enforcement power and because it's allowed to have, that's what's taking, and if you don't think that taking a rent control department off the market on 18th Street and turning it into a hotel room and multiplying that by four or 5,000, if you don't think that's having an impact on housing costs in San Francisco, then you're crazy because that's what's going on. There's, there's one exception <clears throat> to uh, the mayor putting in writing to a, a city official not to enforce the law. Three years ago, uh, the city treasurer, Jose Cis Cisneros, decided that maybe these short-term rentals would be subject to the hotel tax, to the city's transient occupancy tax. And, and so he announced that he was gonna hold a public hearing on this. The day before the hearing, uh, the mayor put out a press release announcing the formation of the Sharing Economy Working Group which was composed of several supervisors, uh, several department heads, and they were going to take a comprehensive look at all the city's laws and regulations that apply to the new sharing economy. And the next day, uh, one of the mayor's staff went to that hearing and, and formally asked the treasurer not to impose the tax on Airbnb and other short-term rentals, 
until the mayor's sharing economy working group had had a chance to go through this exercise of looking at the laws and proposing reforms. The treasurer held his hearing. People argued that, you know, we are renting rooms in our homes, we are not renting hotel rooms. And the treasurer said, well, that's fine and dandy. But on the books, the hotel tax is the transient occupancy tax. And while you may not be renting hotel rooms, you are most assuredly renting to transient occupants. And the tax applies. That was three years ago. And supposedly, Airbnb finally kicked in $30 million in March to cover its back due taxes. Uh, but no one's really quite certain if they wrote the check or just agreed to write the check. Yes. And, Dale, uh, and, how, and how one other thing. <laughs> Mayor's Sharing Economy Working Group? Never met. That was what the question I was going to ask you. How many times did that group meet, Dale? Yeah, never met. Never met. Not once. Yeah. So, so, Dale, since you now have the floor, why is it that uh, 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 Share Better San Francisco wants to uh, do an initiative uh, to regulate short term rentals? You know, the, the Board of Supervisors was told last fall when this shoe legislation was going through, that as constructed, the law was unenforceable. That if the planning department were going to be able to enforce this law, they needed two things. They needed regular reports <coughs> from hosts and hosting platforms as to how many nights a place was rented. And we were going to require hosts to register with the city and include their registration number in their listing on Airbnb, on VRBO, on HomeAway. There are more than 60 websites that offer short-term rentals to tourists in San Francisco. Right? San Francisco. Just in San Francisco. Uh, you know, Calvin did that research, and he stopped counting at 60, and I <laughs> take his word for it. Uh, he even found UCSF and San Francisco State offering short-term rentals. Um, but, you know, so the registration number has to be in the listing. But if the hosting platform as they're known, Airbnb or VRBO, carries a listing for a place and doesn't include the registration number, no consequences, no penalties, no fines. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And planning said to the Board of Supervisors, this is what we've got to have if we're going to enforce this law. Well, that didn't make it into the two legislation which went into effect on the 1st of February. And there was a hearing at one of the board's committees, I don't know, late in February, and the planning department stood up and said, this law is not enforceable. We need the data, and we need the ability to sanction these guys for not carrying the registration numbers. So that's included in our ballot measure. That's included in some legislation that Supervisor Campos has introduced. That is not included in the proposal from the mayor to so supposedly reform the Chu ordinance. It's pretty clear the board, the board is not going to provide meaningful changes. You know, the, the, the mayor's proposal actually makes the enforceability issue even worse. Uh, and we can talk about that if you like. The board is not going to act to do anything significant that is in any way helpful to dealing with the problem of illegal conversions of housing units to um, to hotel rooms. So we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to go to the ballot. Before we open it up, can you just give us uh, five, six bullet points? What does the... Uh... Five points. <clears throat> if, if a hosting platform carries a listing without a registration number, they can be fined. All right? If, you know, if you're a host, if you're a hosting platform that collects the data, and there are a lot of them, you've got to report to the city planning department on a quarterly basis how many nights each unit was rented. There's a 75-day cap on the number of times you can rent a room, a bed, a couch, an entire unit to a tourist. doesn't make any difference if you're home or not. We're going to end that phony distinction between hosted and unhosted rentals. If you live in a building that has a short-term rental, if you live within 100 feet of a building that has a short-term rental, 
we're going to give you the ability to defend your right to the quiet enjoyment of your home and your neighborhood. If you've got a complaint and you file it with the planning department and they don't act within 90 days, if you file the complaint with the city attorney and he doesn't act within 90 days, you can go to court on your own. And you can get injunctive relief, stopping the illegal activity, and you can collect special damages. All right, so the fines that would normally accrue to the city if they, if they acted on a complaint, come to you. Come to you and to your attorney. It's like rent control. Rent control laws are not enforced by the rent control board. They're enforced by tenants and tenant attorneys and landlord and landlord attorneys. They're called private rights of action. They're a well-established principle in the law and they're used in a lot of different ways. And lastly, if you are in the building or you're within 100 feet of the building and someone applies for a permit or a registration number from the planning department and they get it, you get notice. We think, that seems, we think that's reasonable. Planning says we've got to have the data, we've got to have the ability to get after these platforms to violate the law. We're going to give them the tools that they need to enforce the law. When the Planning Commission heard these, heard these legislative proposals in April, late April? April, April 23rd. There were 1,500 complaints about short-term rentals that had been filed with the Planning Department. That was on a Thursday. By the following Monday, there were 543 more. That's a 2,000 case backlog, and they are never going to catch up. And the only way this law is going to be enforced is by neighbors and other tenants in the building and other condos in the building having the right to defend themselves. Okay, questions? Yes. Yes, sir. The first question is, and so the first time I heard about that was uh, maybe more than 18 months ago when there was the first initiative that was started, the QM uh, and the newspaper. So could you give us a sort of historical overview of what happened that time and what, what was kind of the initiative? Was it, was it from you two? And yeah, it was from Welch and Carlson. What happened then? Maybe you can have more. Yeah, Welch and Carlson and the former president of the Planning Commission, Doug Engman, who lived up on Stanley Street for many, many, many years. A guy that Doug and I have worked with over the years came to us and said, do you have any idea how big this short-term rental phenomenon is? He says, I went out and I wrote this little software program and I scraped the data from the three largest sites, Airbnb, VRBO, and HomeAway. And I found 14,500 listings just on those three sites. And we thought, that, that seems awfully high. I mean, we've got 300,000 units in this town, 300,000 residential units. 14,000 is a big number, especially when we're in the worst housing crisis we faced in 100 years. So we asked him to go back and say, you know, maybe there's some duplicates. You know, maybe a place is listed on Airbnb and VRBO, or VRBO and HomeAway. You know, go and call your data a little bit. He comes back and he says, you were right. There's just under 10,000. And we thought, that's still a really big number. So we ran up Calvin, because we've all got this shared interest in, in, in housing issues and affordable housing issues in particular. We started talking about, what the heck can we do about this? And we talked with David Chu at great length, because we knew he had an interest in it. And we talked to the mayor's office, because we didn't think they really wanted a ballot measure, and they said they didn't want a ballot measure, and they were going to bring everybody together, and we were going to sort this all out. Well, we never heard any more from the mayor's office, and we got stiffed by David Chu. Um, but by that point, we had put our, our ballot measure aside in the hopes of negotiating something. You know, we went back to the Board of Supervisors, we went back to the mayor, you know, this time around. It was, you know, it was interesting. We heard the same story in every office we went to in City Hall. Now that David Chu has gone to Sacramento, the political dynamic has changed. And we all know the law that we passed in October and the mayor signed is unworkable and unenforceable, and changes have to be made. But we really don't want to see a ballot measure, so let's work something out. 
We had two, two meetings with the mayor's staff, and then we heard nothing. We had long discussions with Supervisor Mark Farrell, uh, who ostensibly was going back and forth between us and the mayor's staff, uh, but we couldn't come to terms on the enforcement issue. In particular, private rights of action. The mayor's office was very concerned that if we put that in, into the law, that we would have a plethora of ADA type cases where a lawyer goes into the corner grocery with a tape measure and says, oh, your aisles are three inches too narrow. I'm suing you. Or he goes to the corner restaurant and says, oh, your restroom isn't handicapped accessible. I'm suing you. But I'll be happy to say. Right? These are not those kind of, these are not those kinds of cases. They are going to require extensive documentation. They are going to require private investigators who will book reservations uh, in, in, in unregistered units. Uh, you're going to have to document that somebody is renting the place more than whatever the law says the, the limit is. These are expensive, expensive cases to bring, so they're not going to be very many. They're certainly not going to be the ADA type cases. Well, so we tried to negotiate. We and, tried so to negotiate and, got and now signatures are being gathered? We have filed. We are awaiting the official title and summary from the city attorney, which I hope to have tomorrow. Uh, so I expect to be out on the streets uh, next week. We have to get 9,700 valid signatures by the 6th of July. Yes, sir. Um, I've heard that the coalition is an interesting group of organizations, but I haven't heard who is in the coalition. Okay. <coughs> We have the San Francisco Tenants Union and the San Francisco Apartment Association. <laughs> we have the Coalition for Better Housing, which is the largest landlords in, in town, uh, and the Housing Rights Committee. We have Local 2, the hotel workers. We have a number of neighborhood organizations from both sides of town. We have advocates for seniors and the disabled. Airbnb does, in fact, have an ADA problem because none of the listings are ADA accessible. Senior ADA Disability Act, Action, that's right? the name of the movie. Even Airbnb's website doesn't comply with the ADA. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we've got, you know, folks like, like Doug Engman and me who have just been around and involved in civic affairs for a long time. We care about good government and we care about affordable housing. It's an interesting mix. Yes, ma'am. Two quick items. Um, I was here uh, before Election Day when uh, it was decided that this initiative would not go forward, and I said that I thought it was a big mistake because I think many of the people who would have voted for it are now not here <laughs> because they've been evicted. Mm -hmm. So I wish people had not had faith in David Chu <laughs> and others. Um, secondly, uh, I know for a fact that people may say that they have one unit on Airbnb or VBRO, probably have many more. Because this is what happened when friends of mine rented a place through VBRO in Washington, D.C. Uh, call up or email about a particular place. They say, oh, sorry, that one's taken. But I have others. And the yeah. others were not, I have listed. another, but the other is not listed. Yeah. So I'm sure that's happening here as well. The, the most number of units that, I've, that we've found on Airbnb from, from a single individual is 48. Wow. That's a lot. So they, they don't even pay the site for the you know, Correct. list Correct. of no, you don't, you yeah. don't, To be on Airbnb, you do not pay Airbnb to be on the site. Right? Airbnb makes money by charging hosts and guests a commission. Right, but they right? don't even pay a commission on their extra units because that's... No, no, if you, if you book a reservation, if you book a But room, she's saying that one of the things that they do is they can switch. They have units that are not they, even... They only have one. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. And each one of those units, in many cases, was a unit where, prior to this, a long-term tenant was living. And in San Francisco, that long-term tenant was living most likely under rent control. And that person is now gone. In this case, in Washington, D.C., the whole building... And, and, and in every one of these cases, I say, in every case that they have, all 42 of those places in San Francisco, there's a good chance that a tenant or a group of tenants were evicted or displaced 
to turn that into essentially a hotel room. And that's one of the, to me, one of the most fascinating things about the budget analyst report is the numerical correlation, not cause and effect, but a numerical correlation between the number of evictions in an area and the number of short-term rental hosted places that there are. I mean, it's, it's 331, 329, right? You know, 129, 90, I mean, it's, it's not enough that a statistician would say this proves that evictions are caused by Airbnb, but it's enough to say, we've got to look at this real closely. And it's a factor that the short-term rentals that are worth so much more money are a factor in the eviction <clears throat> crisis. We, I, the most egregious case that I've ever seen, <coughs> we've got, we've got a, a young lawyer, one young tenant lawyer who's, who's, who's working with our coalition. He now has a client, three guys in a four bedroom apartment. One of their roommates moved out. The landlord went to those three and said, I'm renting that bedroom on Airbnb. <laughs> and every time one of you guys moves out, I'm renting your room on Airbnb. How would you like to live in that? Yes. So uh, uh, most of the, 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 the worst harm that we've talked about is through full unit rentals, and particularly evictions in order to enable full unit rentals. Most of the worst statistics that were in the, BF, uh, the legislative analysts um, report and that the harm to the availability of housing in San Francisco are through full unit rentals, uh, the people renting multiple units and so on. Totally get that, shouldn't be allowed. Um, one of the three recommendations that Harvey Rose had there was a limit on unhosted nights to differentiate between hosting and non-hosting. And yet the ballot proposal says nothing about that, does not differentiate why is that because how are we supposed to determine how is the city supposed to determine whether a host is sleeping in her own bed at night but your proposal requires hosts already to to say the number of nights that they are present at that property no nope. it says the number of nights you read it. it doesn't say whether or not you're present right and that's very hard to the other the other flip side to this to the oh i'm just renting out the spare bedroom there are people who are doing that because they only want to rent it out a few nights a year or when they're out of town or whatever, and I understand that. And that's why, you know, 60, 75, 90, whatever the number is, I mean, the, you know, I think uh, compost legislation says 60 and yours says 75. Same thing, you can rent out a room a lot, all right? On the other hand, let's go back to the situation you just described. I mean, when I, the first eight or 10 years I lived in San Francisco, I lived in a flat with roommates. And we all, paid rent and we shared the space and I think that's probably the case for a lot of people here and that used to be how people found rentals in San Francisco and when you start saying that you can rent out that room on Airbnb for as much time as you want that form of affordable housing goes away and it was affordable housing I mean you know this is gonna make everybody grimace but my first room in a shared flat um, just down the street from here, where I first met Dale Carlson at a laundromat when we were both much younger, and I was living on, on uh, the end of Hay Street, I was paying $175 a month for a room in a flat with four other folks. And nowadays, of course, as he's talking about, the landlord would not want to do that because he could probably get $110, $120, $150 a night for that room. So even if, even in the more what, you know, the more innocent cases like that, you are still taking away what was once affordable rental housing stock. Um, I was just saying earlier today that this is the only issue that I've ever seen um, tenants and landlords agree on in San Francisco, so there's some kind of historical first. I mean, you know it's gotta be really bad if all those people are coming together and opposing it. And in fact, you know, what I, what I said even further is I think the only people that are happy about it is probably David well, let, let me give you the landlord's perspective. Right. I mean, this, is, this has been a nightmare for these guys, right? You've got people who are renting apartments for the sole purpose of putting them up as short-term rentals without the landlord's knowledge. You've got people who are renting spare rooms in the apartment as short-term rentals. Uh, it's a huge liability problem for them. Right? Because it's a, the insurance company considers that a commercial activity. And their policies don't cover commercial activities in residential buildings. So it's a huge liability problem for them. Up until February 1st, it was illegal. 
that's a liability problem for them. So the landlords have lost their insurance coverage. The insurance companies do the same thing that we do. They scrape the data from these sites and they go looking at the buildings. And if they find one that they're covering, they call up the landlord and say, and say we're canceling your coverage. But you can buy commercial, right? For five times the price. <laughs> or if God help us for the landlord, I mean, something happened. I mean, you, you've all read about the cases where somebody rents an apartment through Airbnb, spends the weekend there with nine friends, trashes it and walks away, all right? Suppose something like that happens or even worse. Somebody gets injured. Somebody gets injured. Somebody gets hurt. Someone gets assaulted. Something really bad happened. Somebody, you know, they, I've got three roommates and one of those rooms gets rented out on Airbnb. The guy comes in, cleans out all of our computers, steals all our stuff and splits, right? I'm gonna sue my landlord. And the landlord is gonna all of a sudden find out that he or she no longer has coverage. So they're, you know. I, I actually do have a question. There was an editorial that actually probably read in the examiner. Yeah. The, the basic argument is it is an invasion of privacy for hosting platforms and hosts to be required to report data to the city about the number of nights a place is rented. It's a gross violation of, of, of privacy rights. And, and my counter is, look, we're talking about businesses. We're not talking about individuals. We're talking about businesses. And businesses are required to report all kinds of data on their activity to all kinds of regulatory agencies. You know, it's, it's not a privacy issue. Airbnb sends 1099s to the federal government, to the Internal Revenue Service. This is the host's name. This is the host's address. This is the host's social security number. And this is the income that the host will derive from doing their short-term rental through us in the past year. And then let me just add to that, okay. All right, we all pay taxes, most of us, and we send that kind of data to the Internal Revenue Service, right? And I know, as a reporter, I can't get Carlson's taxes. I can't find out how much he paid in taxes and how much income he had. The IRS protects that. In fact, much to my frustration, I can't find out how much Twitter saved in its tax break because their taxes are confidential, right? The, the city, collects all kinds of confidential, all of the tax data that the city collects from businesses is confidential, right? When I was at The Guardian and we paid employee payroll taxes, we sent information to the city, that was confidential and it's very, very hard to get. So the idea that this is an invasion of privacy, it's simply information the city's gonna get to use to make its own policies and to make sure you aren't breaking the law. For example, if I don't pay my tax, or if I underpay my taxes, the IRS will be able to check on me and come back to me and say you broke the law. They don't tell everybody else that. They don't send out a press release saying Redmond underpaid his taxes, right? So I think the privacy thing there is, is a little bogus. Yeah, and the other thing is, if we're gonna put a cap on the number of nights a place can be rented, I don't care if it's the Campos number at 60, or ours at 75, or the mayor's at 120, how is the city supposed to determine how many nights a place has been rented and whether they have exceeded the cap if nobody's reporting the data? Are they going to go stand in front of every registered unit and count? Yes, sir. Um, so, okay, so I get that this That's question about how many days in the year is an issue. My question is, what is of these different positions what is the threshold between sort of an individual person doing something that we think is okay and when they become commercial? Like, there's a lot of, you know, informal things that people have done over the years. You know, go on vacation, somebody goes on vacation, they rent out their place or they do a home trade with somebody. Right. Like, what, what's the threshold between what the proposal is and what the current law is? Or what, what's the difference? Listen, if, if you want to trade houses with somebody across the country for the summer, I mean, that to me is home sharing. There's no money changing hands. There's no middleman taking a fat commission. You know, that's really home sharing. If you want to rent a room in your house 75 nights a year, fine. If you want to do it more than that, also fine. But then you need a bed and breakfast permit. 
right? And you ought to be able to get one, and you can. And you can. It just happens that the neighbors will know because you'll, they'll be notified that you've applied for it. You can do this 365 days a year. And I mean, that's a great myth in San Francisco is that you can't do, quote, unquote, home sharing. You can't do bed and breakfast. The reason why I'm asking, I'm asking for the ordinary person, say the ordinary voter who's looking at the ballot, uh -huh. they're going to say, is this going to affect me? Right. Is this going to affect me? Like, if I have a somebody, uh, a relative visiting from another country, and we agree that, um, oh, they're going to give me a little bit of money, Well, if you're not advertising to the public, no, you, you wouldn't. You wouldn't fall into this. You wouldn't fall into this. You wouldn't fall into Chu. You wouldn't fall into the mayor's proposal. Also, the uh, the the budget analyst, after doing a whole bunch of analysis, concluded that 58 days is generally the threshold that dif that differentiates a person like you're describing and a commercial operation. Um, you know, a day or two either way, certainly 75 days. And by the way, the budget analyst report is very, very conservative. It starts with probably half the number of Airbnb units that are actually being used for commercial purposes because they were very, very conservative about this. So, you know, 60 days, 75 days. If you're renting out a room in your house for more than 75 days, you're becoming a bed and breakfast. An innkeeper. And that, again, it comes, that's fine. In fact, when this was being discussed at the city, at the Board of Supervisors, Supervisor Jane Kim asked the city planning department staff how many times an Airbnb permit application had been turned down in the last 20 years. They couldn't think of a single one. No, you mean a B&B. A B&B, B &B, B &B, excuse me, a B&B. &B. A regular, a traditional B&B. &B. Someone had said, I want to turn my house into a part-time and I'm going to have rent out extra rooms and make people breakfast in the morning. I want a permit. How many of those have been denied? Zero. Now, obviously, if 10,000 people in the hate wanted to do it, there'd start to be an issue with the neighbors, but then we would know. Airbnb says it's typical host in San Francisco rents six and a half nights a month. So that's about 78, 78 nights. And we're just under that. So I, I, I think about the people on the completely other end of the scale that are living in SROs, and they have to go through the merry-go-round every 29 days. So how does 58 days, where's 58 days come from? You know, when, you know, I mean, it's just such a disparity between small hotel, SROs, EMBs, you know, it's just, it's... I, I don't understand what you're saying about SROs. Well, it, it, SROs are single room occupancy. They pay, they're not a hotel. They don't pay a hotel tax because they're required by law to rent for more than 30 days. Right, and so if they were to rent for more than 30 days, then it'd be the rental, correct? They are. Well, it would be a, but they don't, SROs don't pay the hotel tax. They're right. not hotels. Right. Because only registered units can be rented for less than 30 days. Right, so when the threshold hits at 30, then it becomes, then they start paying the tax, right? No, yeah. no, no oh, tax. Okay. They become... A per, you become a permanent resident. No, the, the, the reason that SROs... You can't be evicted okay. by a whim. You can't be told to hit the road. Right. No, the reason that some unethical SRO owners try to get their tenants to move out after 28 days is so they won't be under rent control. Right. 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 And by law, they're not supposed to do that. And some of them still try. But it's a whole different, it's a whole different thing. Okay. Thanks. Yes. So the budget analyst report had three points. Are those one of your... Three of your five? Are, is this all in sync? Like, is this yeah. a new opportunity to go to all those people you already went to and say, look, this is already in the budget? Well, except conference. that they have an alternate ordinance that has none of this, that the budget analyst wasn't asked to analyze. The budget analyst was asked to analyze Supervisor Campos's ordinance, which was based on our initiative. And so the budget analyst took a look at basically our initiative and agreed that the that what's in our initiative should should probably be passed the uh, supervisor Farrell and the mayor did not submit uh, their uh, you can do that uh, you, there's no law that says the budget analyst has to analyze every piece of legislation there's only a law that says the city's economist has to analyze every piece of legislation uh, so they didn't. Their their ordinance was not looked at. Everyone who's looked at this independent of us, independent of Airbnb, has come to the same conclusion. 
The only way something like this is enforceable is if you get data, and if there are fines on hosting platforms that list the illegal units. I, Portland I, has just thought, I, I didn't really see what those three were, I just thought there were three. Portland has basically started to do the, the, the same thing that we're talking about doing here in San Francisco, that, that you can't, they're saying the Airbnb, you can't list a unit on Airbnb that isn't registered with the city. And right now, that would mean Airbnb would be able to list 284 units. Is right. that the number? That 290 maybe? There's, that's how many units have been registered with the city. Right. And if you say to Airbnb, you can't put anything else up, well, then the whole thing goes away until people agree to register with the city and, so that, and let the city to track the data. Amazon has been forced to collect taxes. Right. Right. Why can't Airbnb be forced to collect well, taxes? They, they are now. They, are. they have. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. they yeah. claim they have. No, no one has seen the money, but they but have we announced. Won't, again, we won't see the money because that's confidential, right? Like all, this, all the data that everybody's worried is going to become public. I wish, as a reporter, I could see if they'd written that check or not. But for very good reason, the city does not make that tax data public. Dale and I talked with Supervisor Yee today and, and got into this. I mean, we're in this never-never land. The treasurer is supposedly, uh, is an independently elected official. He's up for election this November. Everybody know that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I bet you didn't. Uh, um, uh, the treasurer has reached an agreement, private, with a $10, $15 billion corporation that they will pay a hotel tax at 14 percent, a, a, a big number. Now, you know that in order to collect that tax, the treasurer has to know how many nights a tourist was in that unit. So the treasurer knows that. Airbnb, in its terms of service, says to its, we're going to report that if we're required to. So the treasurer knows, but nobody else in the city who's charged to enforce the ordinance is allowed to know. I mean, it's it's a never never land. Did they pay their back taxes? Supposedly. 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 Would it be up to the uh, I don't know the DA or the city attorney to subpoena this data? Well, I, mean, I sure data. you'd think, wouldn't wouldn't you? You'd think. Okay. Is there any city where they have New York. Yeah. New York. Yeah. Yes. No, the New, New York, York State. The New York State Attorney General did and, and got a call from Ron Conway. <laughs> Literally True. got a call from Ron Conway. Yeah. yeah, saying don't mess with me, I own San Francisco and I can own you too. That's right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So just a quick question for you guys, on the political level, are there some supervising who support the initiative? And uh, it's, I assume Peskin was uh, yes. 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 For District Three, right? Yes. Yeah. They need to support yes. 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 Um, so I'm, I'm going to assume that, that the members in our coalition who support Aaron in D3 will campaign for him and campaign for our measure in D3. Chances are very good that Supervisor Christensen will not vote for our measure, the, the compost measure. And it will be a very bright line difference between her and Pascal. Uh, uh, and it, it's kind of odd that the mayor would force her to do that. Uh, doesn't seem politically smart to me, but um, you know, uh, I don't. I don't have to deal with Ron Conway. He does. So, so what about the other supervisor? What do they stand? It's going to be uh, six to five. I think we're going to have the support of Avalos, Chu, uh, Mar. Chu. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Avalos. Uh, uh, Compost, Mar, Mar, Kim, Kim Yee. and Yi. London, London Breed is voting. What about London Breed? Yeah. London Breed has voted for the mayor and uh, uh, Ron Conway's every. position on Airbnb on every amendment in October. She told 
myself and uh, the head of the Apartment House Owners Association that she would support three of the amendments. She, in fact, before she voted no, said that she had met with Calvin and the apartment house owners, and, and you know, what a great day that was to see them <laughs> together, and I'm so delighted to vote against both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I salute her, that's, that's, that's real brass. You know, but, uh, uh, no, she is not going to support uh, this measure, and it will be, if we all have a memory, a bright line defining issue when she runs next year in uh, District 5, where she will be challenged. It is uh, my proven hope. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so you were talking about the SRO thing. I'm going, I'm going to go backwards. Um, hypothetically, I have a bunch of people housed in an SRO. They're charging me weekly rent and talking about the 29 day mark. I've passed that 29 day mark seven months over yet they're still charging me weekly rent. Pretty high. Is that considered, is that illegal even though it's an SRO now and it's no. a single resident? Okay. No. They can, they can charge you rent any way they want to. They can charge you daily rent. They just can't evict you after you've been, they can't show you the door except for failure to pay rent right. and other uh, uh, just causes. And you're under rent control. Once you've been there 30 days, they can't raise your rent more than the legal amount. So in other words, they can charge you whatever they want, weekly, daily, monthly, but they got to stick to it once you've been there 30 days because you were then a legal resident. Yeah. I heard from some hosts that they received some paperwork saying that they also had to submit for taxes for Airbnb. So do you know how that's going to play out in the future if they're going to have the host submit for taxes or just Airbnb take that for Well, that's one of the interesting contradictions. If... The treasurer has reason to believe that a person, you know, it, it could be the person, the, the issue that you talked about, a person that had one unit on Airbnb, but in fact was renting three units, two of which were not on Airbnb. Airbnb wouldn't pay the hotel tax for the two units that it doesn't know about, but the two units, if, if somehow the treasurer knows that those are being used, uh, might well charge uh, 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 the owner as well. VRBO has a different business model as well. It doesn't collect any money. So anybody listing a unit on VRBO, would the treasurer would see that that unit is there and would send them a bill because uh, they don't deduct the money like Airbnb does. They don't intercede. So perhaps the person was listed on both platforms, maybe Airbnb and VRBO. I, I don't know if Airbnb allows that or if VRBO allows yeah, that. They, they, do. they don't care. They do. Okay, yes. then if, if, they're dub, if they're on two websites, the treasurer would know that VRBO did not, does not remit the, the hotel tax. And so they may well, um, I mean, that's why these websites have to disclose, you know? The thing about the home share that's so odd for me to, uh, to get my head around is that the cheats make it rougher for them. And it would seem to me that they would be in favor of stopping abuses, especially multiple uh, 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 unit owners. Uh, but they don't. They all lockstep together and they will all oppose this measure. A measure that will not affect them virtually in any way. I, I mentioned earlier that you know the, the biggest multiple lister on Airbnb that we had found had 48 units. I had a conversation a month or two back with a guy named David Hampton, who is the head of global public policy for Airbnb. And right around the time that the Attorney General of New York was subpoenaing Airbnb for its data, they announced that they had tossed uh, a thousand or two thousand so-called bad actors off their platform in New York. David, what constitutes a bad actor? He says, we had a guy with 256 systems. Wow. Right now in New York, you can only do a short-term rental in your unit 
when you are present. Right? That be your primary residence. He's a busy guy. Yeah. So, at least 255 <laughs> hours were illegal. Right? How long did you present though? Five minutes in? And he said to me, you know, he was making a lot of money off of us. And I'm thinking, yeah, you were making a lot of money off of us, too. Yeah. He says, but he had bad reviews. <laughs> it made us look bad. And that's why we tossed him. So let me get this straight. You're aiding and abetting a guy who is violating a multitude of laws in New York. And the only reason you bounce him is because he's got bad reviews? What? It, it, it is a mystery to me how a company can get to a $20 billion valuation when its basic business model is predicated on wholesale violations of local laws. It, it, it's, it's stunning to me. Bobby. I saw a video recently of uh, Ron Conway, notorious for <coughs> bullying, but giving an interview to a TechCrunch reporter uh, and, and insisting that the Airbnb phenomenon is having no impact yeah. on housing in San Francisco. Well, yeah, 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 so the, question, the question in my mind, thinking about you know what vulnerabilities he might have, um, is he a registered <coughs> lobbyist in the city? No. No, he's not. As of like a week ago when I checked, he was not registered as a lobbyist. No. He lives in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think he sold. I think he, he moved to Tiburon. Did he move to Tiburon? Good. Well, he's, all right, my voter registration database is a few months out of date. Um, he was registered to vote in San Francisco. He had a place in one of the fancy high rises. Um, as he, he may have moved since the Tiburon. You're a charming guy. You believe that a, a person registered to vote in fact. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, I remember Joe Aliotta talking about the beauty of the commuting San Franciscan voter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Calvin, Calvin. 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 What my neighbor here uh, referred to before, the point is, however logical it seems amongst people who have already studied the matter in depth, the way, for instance, Prop G was shot down was by lying about it. So how are Absolutely. we going to get the message across as to what's really at stake. Starting as early as we can, talking to as many people. I, I, I will, I'll tell you, that the campaign that I expect Airbnb to run is going to feature uh, folks uh, with very you know, heartwarming, heart-tugging stories about, if I wasn't able to do this, I would lose my home. But the I wouldn't be able to pay my kids' college tuition. I wouldn't be able to... Uh, you know, pay my medical expenses. We're going to get one after another. So we're going to march out people who have been victimized by Airbnb. Airbnb hurts regular people. I mean, if you came along and said, we're going to take 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 units out of the housing market, we're going to demolish them. And it's not going to have any impact on rents or prices or anything else. And we're not going to replace them. And we're not going to replace them. You know, that's a non-starter, but that's effectively what's happened. Airbnb hurts <coughs> regular people. But landlords and tenants didn't agree on property, and landlords and tenants agree on this. Yeah. That must be yeah. very powerful. I, you know, I think, you know, I've been doing politics in this town for more than 30 years, and, I, I, and the only time I've dealt with the, the landlords and the tenants, you know, they've been at each other's throats. So for them to be chummy, so we go to meet at the apartment association, and, you know, Bobby is there, and they serve us lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's not poison? And it's not poison, right? Yeah, I'm, really I'm like, sorry, Bob. I'm this time. Go ahead. But I, I, I interrupt you. Oh, no, yeah, just, just on the on the Rod Conway phenomenon, I mean, what we're looking at is a guy, who, you know, who started as a working guy, as a salesman for National Semiconductor mm -hmm. in the early days of computer, basically selling computer chips. So his M.O. is basically to say that his product is great, and has no problem. And that's basically what we're still seeing. <clears throat> yeah. I was just uh, curious again about, I mean, this is your presentation earlier, but uh, we have 6,000, 7,000 listed in the in this recent report, in December 2004, number of, the, number of units that were on the market. 
Uh, does anyone have a, do we have a ballpark as to what the total rental unit market is in San Francisco? Today? It's about 270,000 units. Uh, for, for rent, or that would be vacant for rent. Up, 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 up. Well, that was a big, uh, that was a big debate that we had with, it, it, simple answer is the uh, no. Uh, the most recent solid number from the Census uh, Bureau uh, is 2013, and anybody who knows the housing market in San Francisco knows that between now and 2013, the vacancy rate has declined. Uh, uh, landlords, uh, the Apartment House Association, uh, 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 and the Coalition for Better Housing, the two people that's in our coalition that are in the business, we asked them, what are your guys' working assumptions? How do you, when you finance, when you go to buy and want to get a loan for an apartment building, what do the banks say the vacancy rate is? I mean, if the vacancy rate is 50%, they're not going to loan you any money to go into the rental business. If the vacancy rate is minus two, they'll be happy to loan you money. They're happy to loan people money, and the working assumption from the industry is it's 1.5% vacancy rate. We couldn't get the... the, the uh, uh, even though we trotted these guys out to them, we couldn't get the budget analysts to accept that number. They went with a 2013 census number. So when Tim says that their analysis is very conservative, it's very conservative. That is to say, they believe that there <clears throat> is a vacancy rate of almost 4% in San Francisco. 3.6, I think, is what they're working with. And it's nobody in the business uh, uh, believes that it's anywhere, believes that it's about half that. And if it's half that, the impact of these units is the, I mean, do, do the math. 1.7% of 270 is the Airbnb. They are the vacancy rate, you know. So the one thing that the proposed ballot measure uh, provides is this private cause of action, which you explained right. why you felt that was necessary. That if the city attorney doesn't act, and if the first plan doesn't act, then you and your lawyer <coughs> can act to sue, and you can get um, penalties of two hundred and fifty to a thousand dollars a day against the uh, what's called permanent resident, and yeah. the, the person who owns or rents uh, most of the time. I didn't, uh, there's some penalties against the hosting platforms, but I didn't really say there was any kind of cause of action against them in the same way, and the penalties didn't seem to be. There's no private state. right of action available against the hosting platforms. But we that, 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 is, that is solely within the discretion of the city attorney. And the district attorney, because you could argue that they are guilty of conspiracy to violate laws. If we had, um, if we had a district attorney who wanted to do that. Yeah. So, so why is it focused on the, on the individual? We think if the hosting platform is behaving egregiously, the city attorney will be happy to go after them and be happy to collect a very, very, very large check. I mean, the, the penalties that are accruing in Portland right now, uh, it's about $350,000 a month just against the top three platforms. That's a fair amount of money in Portland. That'd be a fair amount of money down here. Yeah, I, I only saw a thousand dollars a day as, a, as the maximum price. Two fifty to a thousand, right? No, no, but for the hosting platform, it seems to be a thousand dollars a day, which would seem like Airbnb can afford three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars a year. I'm sorry, I can't look. It, it seems like you, you, the penalty for the host for the hosting platform is capped at a thousand dollars a day yes. per per event. <laughs> Per unit, per unit. Not, not, uh, not a, it's not the max they can ever get is $365,000 a year. No, $1,000 a day per listing, yeah. per violated listing. So that could be big money. Yeah. Uh, can you say a little bit more about what's happening in New York? I mean, has it, has it met with success? Has there been legal challenges? What's the state of play there? Well, right now the mayor of New York is at a fundraiser here in San Francisco that's being hosted by Ron Conway. Oh. <laughs> As we speak. De Blasio. De Blasio. Okay. De Blasio. So we're, we're not sure, and, and the attorney general apparently has not uh, been quite as aggressive as he was originally either. So the folks in New York are a little discontented. 
but there are 15, 18,000 listings in New York on Airbnb. How many? 15, 18,000, something like that. It's a big number. It's a big number, but you know, they've got more than 3 million units. What is the law in New York? The law in New York, New York says you cannot do a short term rental unless you are present. What de Blasio was willing to do is enforce the law, the existing law. And uh, uh, our sister organization, Share Better New York, um, uh, put forward a, a the, the city council in New York is very anti. Uh, short-term rental, um, uh, but New York, as you well know, is is a mayoral system. The, the mayor is very powerful. So what they were able to get out of De Blasio was the creation. Sometimes I love New York of of a strike team that included a person from the health department, a person from the building inspection department, and a cop. And they would go to a listing. And this was their, they would ask, are you the owner? Is the owner present? If not, they kicked them out of the unit. <laughs> they emptied the unit. <laughs> <laughs> if they could not prove that this was their unit, that, or, or they, they were renting it, they were shown the door. So, you know, I, 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 they got, uh, my understanding is they got something like $15, $20 million to, to do enforcement in New York, and that's the enforcement. So that's something. But no, people don't, our, our, our sister organization is a little bum kick Just, at de Blasio. Um, when I want to ask the Rupert's question about going after Airbnb rather than, I'm wondering if you're kind of hidden agenda here is if you think that enough people will bring individual suits against hosts that it will ultimately weaken, you know, undermine the host organizations and you're kind of trying to go about it that way. Is that something that I think personally as, as much as some folks would like to just completely ban short term rentals and drive Airbnb out of business, I just don't that's not in the cards. And it probably shouldn't be because, you know, for people who want to rent an extra room from time to time and make a little extra money, fine, you know, Godspeed. But this notion that we could have eight, nine, <coughs> ten thousand units, and eighty percent of them are entire units, and they're out of the housing market and converted to hotel rooms, that's not that is not acceptable to me. So if I can, if we can squeeze that number down to two thousand. To the folks who are actually renting just the spare room, I'll be very happy. But Bobby, Bobby is on the board of the San Francisco Tenant Union, who has, uh, if there's a junkyard dog and enforcement of rent control ordinances, uh, it's the Tenant Union. What is the experience that you all have had in private rights of action in enforcing? Which do you guys go after large rental? Companies, or do you go after uh, more often landlords, individual landlords? The attorney um, built a, a number of cases where he had evidence, and so it, it, the, the the larger the larger entities hide that evidence. Part of the, part of the deal. With. That's part of the uh, scenario. And that's our that's our experience with Airbnb. It's very hard. How do you prove that Airbnb violated a local ordinance? Right. I mean. I don't know how I don't know how we would do that. So we either won or settled advantageously all the all the cases, and they weren't they weren't with uh, with big entities. They were right. small entities. Sure. Well, no. Getting to this gentleman's point about why why no private right of action against the you know, the platform. I mean, I, I'm a lawyer. This is not my area, but I think similar to what Uber and Lyft are, are claiming. You know, they say, "Well, we're just a." We're not really in the business of providing transportation. We're not really in the business of providing housing. I think it's a lot easier. It's a lower hanging fruit and a lot less complicated to just allow a private right of action against the offending um, landlord versus trying to allow individuals versus trying to create a private right of action 
that the individuals have against the platform company. It's just too complicated. So I, I, I think it seems to me the way you're going about it makes a lot of sense. Thanks. I, I love these. I love these companies that claim that, like Uber, like Lyft, like what was it, Leap? Yes, Leap has the new bus. Yeah, yeah. We, are, we are not in the transportation business. <laughs> we are a technology company that simply connects people to transit. And I keep thinking, let's see, Pizza Hut has an app. So I guess that makes Pizza Hut a tech company that connects people to pepperoni. <laughs> 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 How stupid do they? Of action or whatever it's called. Right of action. Right of action. Does that mean I'd have to hire a lawyer and pay the lawyer and take all the, that? The money idea off? here is that actually you won't have to because the idea is there are a lot of tenant lawyers in town who, when you point this out to them, will say, okay, I'll take that on contingency if there's evidence that's happening because, in the end, I'm going to get a fee. And this is the way. This is a tenant's private. Situation. Yeah, private. No, no, but I'm saying. Right now, tenant lawyers, if you go and look for a tenant lawyer to sue your landlord and you say to the person, look at what she's done, this, 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 and this, and the tenant lawyer says, Jesus, that's worth a million bucks, and they're going to get 20% of it or 30% of it, they'll take the case. Private rights of action only work if there's attorney's fees involved or if there's sufficient recovery involved that it'll pay an attorney's time to do it. And that's why this was set up this way, so that no, you, yes, you will be able, have to hire an attorney, but most of the, the attorneys who are going to do this are going to do it on the idea that they're going to win in fees. Otherwise, it'll never happen. If you don't have attorney's fees as that carrot out there, it's never going to happen. Who in their neighborhood is going to pay $10,000 to hire a lawyer to stop an Airbnb? It only works if there's a, an end game there. This it doesn't always work in politics, but the Lee Farrell legislation bans a private right of action. So uh, if they ban it, I'm for it. You know, I mean. <laughs> well, there's also a provision in Lee Farrell that, you know, when you register to do a short-term rental, there's supposed to be a public registry. Now, it's not going to be online. You have to go down to the planning department and ask to see it, and it will be on paper. And under the CHU ordinance, the planning department had the right to redact the name associated with the short-term rental permit, right? Under the mayor's proposal, planning can redact the name and the address. Okay. So you'll get a nice blank piece of paper. So what's, what's left? Someone. What's, what is, what is left? What are you going to see? Maybe a zip code? I don't know. And, 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 and that is, that makes an unenforceable law even more unenforceable. In the name of making it more enforceable. But, but does that fly in the face of the California Public Records Act? Well, Probably. Think, but somebody's going to have to sue. Right. Does the Records Act have a private right of action? Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> and you don't have to pay for it. Right. You have fund, state funds set up if yep. you win. Yep. They'll pay, all, they'll pay all your fees. And we've got a complaint driven enforcement process, right? You've got to complain to planning. You've got to complain to the city attorney. If you think somebody in your building or somebody on your block is doing this and they're not registered, you go to the public registry, and it's not going to tell you whether or not they're registered. It or if you do name. complain because you think they're behaving, and the planning department says we've looked at the secret list and their name's not there, mm -hmm. what recourse do you have? You have no recourse. You don't. Well, wait a minute. What, can I see the secret? No, you can't see the secret list. Is the yeah. Carol a ballot, or is that? No, it's an ordinance. And, and the, it will, the Lee Farrell and the Campos ordinances will be, both be heard at the Board of Supervisors Land Use Committee on Monday. And the tentative date I've been given for the, um, both of them to go to the full board is June the 9th. I, I, think they're, I think it may be back to the second. And is that right? Then, then what happens? Yeah. And then well, they the, 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 the Lee, Lee Farrell will pass. And they will announce we've solved the problem. And Campos will be defeated, which is why we're doing the petition. And then that will override it. <coughs> if the petition yeah. wins, it, it overrides it everything. Overrides everything. Yeah. Uh, 
Scott Wiener is trying to apply in Noe Valley what the special use district was that he did in the Castro correct, correct. to allow kind of infill of, uh, you know, within the footprint you can divide up a garage or whatever. Correct. And he wants to do that in Noe Valley. Correct. So, as far as I'm concerned, we've done our share in Noe Valley. I mean, we're getting our Victorians torn down on 24th Street. And, Square boxes are going up. So, so this is for house. affordable housing. So you must be a, against affordable housing. So we said to him, <laughs> okay, no supervisor, way. if this is for affordable housing, yeah. you will put in your legislation that it can never be used for a short-term rental. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I, I will not ban short-term rentals being in these units. Yeah. So, I mean, figure that one out. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this is... Market-based affordable housing never works, folks. It never works. Yeah. When you use the market to produce mm -hmm. affordable housing, it just creates more market rate housing. And what, in, in the name of the housing, the affordable housing crisis, what Scott is proposing, and what he has done in a, a, a small area and now wants to enlarge throughout all, virtually all of DA, is that you can add, no matter what the zoning is, you can add another unit, an in-law, new, you can build one. Uh, um, uh, and it will not be subject to rent control, and he will not restrict it from being used as a short-term rental. Now, it will increase the assessed valuation of the property, and your property taxes will go. So obviously the strategy for any rational person <coughs> is that just before you sell the house, you get this permit. And you do it, and you enhance the value of the house tremendously, and you sell it. Which does what for housing costs in San Francisco? Drives them further up. And this is a, a market-based solution to affordable housing with no requirement that the housing actually be affordable. Or you build that extra unit in your backyard or you turn your basement into another no, unit. No, that's Supervisor Tang. No, no, I know. But it has to you, be within the right, envelope. The the envelope. envelope. So you, you build that extra unit and then you just put it on Airbnb. Right. right. Supervisor Tang is proposing, however, that you do get to build in the backyard, right. a new building in the backyard. And put that on Airbnb. Right. Was it Supervisor Kim that was trying to introduce legislation to ensure that you couldn't Airbnb it? Yes, so yes, yes. She carried struck, our, she carried our, yes, down. and it lost. Yes. Back to the mayor of New York, who is being uh, courted by Ron here, according to you. What has happened to the three person? Enforcement in New York. Well, it, it's it's funded it's still, by, the, by the council, and my my understanding is it's it's they're doing it. They're it's doing still it. Still doing it, no matter how the uh, mayor votes. Well, I think he, I think that's you know it's 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 how you kiss and bite in politics. You know, politics is all about. Will be a new TV series. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You go one side and then you go the other. Yeah. Um, I'm concerned about what somebody said back here about the the opposition not being clear enough because I used to be a strategist and I can see yes they'll do the funny side oh, of course. of uh, you know this is a person who needs extra money and but they're also going to do the disinformation side and they're going to say something unintended like, consequences. They're going to say something yeah. like oh you think you sublet your place, forget about it. Yeah. Or they're going to take anything that's not clear and they're going to do a whole campaign. A ab absolutely. Really nasty. But, but so ma have to they're, be ready for that. Ma'am, we cannot stop a $10 billion corporation saying that the sun no, rises in the south. What they're going to do. And, <laughs> yeah. they, they will, and there's not much we can do about it. Well, then uh, they can be really clear. Well, it, believe me, ma'am, it is really clear. But it doesn't make any difference if it's really clear. A, nobody's going to read it. And B, they're only going to hear what the media, uh, the Chronicle is, uh, is adamantly opposed to, will be adamantly opposed to it. 
So we have an uphill struggle, no question about it. It's actually who establishes the information first. Yes. Whether that information is right or wrong, whoever well, establishes it first. That's what happened to Prop G. Yes. The Prop G, we didn't yeah. establish it first. Well, that's why we're doing this one with a petition. We're going right. to be talking to San Franciscans early about this. We're going to try to have a presence. Uh, some of us urged that G should have been put on the ballot by a petition. It was decided to go through the Board of Supervisors, which made it invisible for about mm -hmm. four months. Uh, uh, and everybody kind of went into radio silence. We're going to be yelling. There's, there's going to be a, a, a series of votes at the Board of Supervisors in June. Uh, we're going to show up. We're going to uh, talk loud and mean. And uh, 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 supervisors are going to talk loud and mean about uh, what this means. We're going to make it an issue. We did a poll last year. We did a poll this year. It's shifting in our direction. Sentiment is shifting in our direction. Go to Google and Google short-term rental. And what you now see is what's happening in Santa Monica, it's what's happening in Sacramento. Sacramento, 29 days. Sacramento. Uh, 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 it's all about uh, horror stories of Airbnb and local governments upset at the impact of Airbnb on uh, their housing markets. Do you have a petition here that we can sign? I'll have it next week. We'll have it next week. But <laughs> what, what I would like to do is uh, to ask the Haight Ashbury, the general membership of the Haight Ashbury Neighborhood <clears throat> Council, to support uh, uh, the Share Better initiative and join, formally join uh, the Share Better Coalition <clears throat> again. Uh, we joined it last time, but I think uh, we need to, to join it again. So uh, as a member in good standing, uh, uh, I would so move that we endorse the petition and join, formally join Share Better SF again. There are 14 members signed in. That's a motion. I, I, I so moved. I heard, heard a second. Second. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, so you support the petition and you can now legitimately attend the meetings again. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, one, one thing, besides, of course the issue that you're talking about is paramount. But I also think in terms of the campaign, that there are some side effects that are beyond the size uh, displacement of people and, and housing, just in terms of neighborhood yes. quality. Yes. Um, the building next door to us, I live in Fell, the building next door to us has about 11 small units. It's a uh, tenant town. We know almost to cert certainty that one and probably two of them, and maybe even more, but certainly one or two, are rented out in these short-term rentals. The security in the area has gone down because somebody, someone who lives in that building looks out and they see someone who's unfamiliar to them. Well, it used to be they would say, you know, what are you doing here, or are you, are you new in the building? But it appears that they're not doing that now because they're just used to people being there short term. Also, things like um, um, maintenance of the building. A lot of things like that that affect quality in the neighborhood yes. are, are a, 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 a external consequence of the short term balance. That's why West of Twin Peaks Council, made up of 23 Western District 7 uh, uh, neighborhood organizations, have joined the coalition. They have already seen the deterioration in their neighborhoods. And that's one of the reasons that we require neighbors to be noticed. And believe me, we are going to campaign on, on neighborhood quality. Uh, uh, yesterday, yeah, Wednesday, uh, in Sacramento, uh, was a hearing on a bill uh, being proposed by Senator, uh, Senator McGuire 
that would basically make it state law to do our initiative. Our initiative. It's, it requires Airbnb to list registered folks if that's the local law. It requires, if that's the local law, that, that uh, hosting platforms provide municipalities with data. Uh, um, and uh, it passed, uh, uh, the, the, this is the second uh, committee that it, that it passed. And while I was unable to go, uh, a friend of mine did go and told me that three of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the way it works in the state, they, it, it, if, if you're upset about making a two minute speech at a San Francisco hearing, I mean, in, in Sacramento, you get about 35 seconds. <coughs> Uh, but they have a series of, of, uh, of kind of gifted speakers that the, usually the legislature wants to try to shape the argument. Three of them were police. And that was exactly one from Truckee who told the story of all kinds of shenanigans going on now on Airbnb rented uh, a timeshare. They thought timeshares were a problem. Airbnb is timeshares on steroids, yes. and it creates incredible policing problems <coughs> in a touristy town. Uh, um, and there were two other, one from Southern California and one from extreme Northern California, uh, police chiefs uh, 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 testifying, we need this data. We need to know all kinds of evil things happen in these units, and we need to know who's there. It was a little scary. Uh, <laughs> for my friend who's a great civil libertarian. But it is an issue. It is a, a for real issue. You are absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not very familiar with this issue, so I'm here mostly in learn time. But you mentioned that VRBO has a different model yes. than Airbnb. Yes. And they're both in the city. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so when this petition gets drafted and before the voters, is it possible that um, that uh, VRBO will come in against it because it's going to diminish their clientele as well? Or what are the effects? What, the, the general question is, what are the effects of these two different models on this issue? <coughs> two different companies. If you list on Airbnb, you don't pay any fees up front. When somebody books your place, you pay 3% of the booking fee to Airbnb and the guest pays between 12 and 15 percent. So Airbnb is making 15 to 18 percent on every booking, all over the world. On VRBO, you pay a few hundred bucks a year, it's like a subscription. And, that, and that's how they Who's make it. The, the owner or the owner? Or the, or the, the owner. The the owner. Yeah, go ahead. The owner. And so if, if you were coming to San Francisco and you're looking at VRBO, you find a listing that you like, and you interact directly with the, the property, owner. With the yeah. owner, yeah. right? And you pay the owner directly, however they want to do it. PayPal, credit card, wire, however they however they want to do it. Now, Home Away has a very similar model, uh, but both of them have looked at the success that Airbnb has enjoyed, and they're starting to roll out middleman models of their own as an option. They'll say to their listing, if you would like us to handle the money, and you would like us to collect and remit the hotel taxes that are due, we're happy to do that for you. And we will take the commission. Smaller than Airbnb's to be competitive. Um, but, you know, it, it's one or the other. So I don't know that VRBO is going to weigh in on this. Right. VRBO had a deal. They made a deal with Airbnb. Uh, that Airbnb would deal with the San Francisco Board of Supervisors and the San Francisco Mayor because they were so well connected. And they would make sure that the legislation the board passed last fall would satisfy VRBO's concerns as well as Airbnb's. Well, they screwed VRBO. <laughs> Absolutely screwed them. They wrote that legislation in such a fashion that Airbnb and Airbnb alone could handle short-term listings in the city. VRBO was not pleased. <laughs> in fact, they were so unpleased, they back channel called us and told us the story that they were not pleased. So and is it possible that they might 
I think by them not being in is assistance enough. Yeah. One of the things that is really fascinating to me about the, the sharing economy and, and the tech industry is how they don't hang together. When Google was in trouble over the buses, you didn't see Airbnb show up. You didn't see Lyft show up. You didn't see Uber show up and turn their people out for Google. When Airbnb legislation was before the Board of Supervisors, you didn't see Google, you didn't see Lyft, you didn't see Uber. These guys really are um, uh, rugged individualists, uh, libertarians, and they really don't work together. And it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon to see. And uh, I think we're going to be up against Airbnb, period. Yeah. I mean, not that that's not big enough. Uh, you know, they make more money a year than, you know, Tim makes a day. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Tim, I'm just curious, because I'm not Sure. Yeah. They will. Oh, yeah. They're yeah, not we're, we're, so we're, we're, enamored with. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. No. We're, Quite the contrary. We're actually hoping that the Wayne Barrel Dungeon passes. They hope it does? I hope it passes. Because? Because it makes it so much easier to campaign okay. against what this board has done. It and actually have, weakens yeah. important parts of CHU. You know? I mean, doing away, you don't have to, you don't have to give an address for registration. Okay, you know? got it. No private right of action. You're prohibited from a private right of action. It's, it's wacky. Yeah. The, the sharing economy, um, there's a real kind of a Wild West flavor about it and, and a very selfish attitude. And I'm wondering, do you see this as, as a, a, a growing libertarian attitude? Both the techies, yeah. Yeah, the deeper side of all of this, of course, is the, you know, the end game is the no real jobs economy where everybody is a freelancer on TaskRabbit and nobody has any health insurance or any job security or any retirement or any ability to know whether they're going to be working next week, right? And it's not surprising this is all being done by 23-year-olds, mm -hmm. right? And it's government yeah. out of my business. Yeah. I'll yeah. do what I want and government. Yes, out. yes. But, but, not, but not Airbnb. Airbnb gets to monetize your business. Right. Everything about you. you know, it's incredible what they require you to give over to them to register. Your Facebook page. No, no, I know, but I mean, it's incredible the data that they collect from, from their users. If you want to be a guest on Airbnb, you have to provide a copy of your driver's license copy of your passport, you have to give them access to your social media accounts, you have to provide a credit card, and you have to do a video profile talking about how wonderful you are. And all of that resides on Airbnb <coughs> servers. And, and, uh, and doesn't go away, it's permanent. Right. And, they and privacy is the issue. Yeah. <laughs> we cannot give to the Department of City Planning how many days a week our members use uh, that, 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 that we just can't do that. But we'll give 1099s to the NSA. <laughs> <laughs> the NRA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a couple of political requests that I have sort of thoughts about this. One is that, um, I don't know if, how we do this, but perhaps we ought not be using the term sharing economy. That no, no, I, we I, refer I, to it as short-term rentals, STRs. Yeah, I, and sounds, like a, sounds like a sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> that's, that's fine, but I think that it, you know, it does, we, we reinforce their notion if we use their terminology. Um, and the other thing is, reflecting on what this gentleman over here said about sort of the, the, the change in, in the flavor of the neighborhood. Absolutely. Community. I think that that's true. I think that what's a more powerful political argument is to, to talk about it in terms of public safety. Yep. and to talk about it in terms of crime. Mm -hmm. and
and to basically scare the shit out of people about the person you don't know who's coming in. <laughs> now, it's not like it makes me that comfortable to talk about it that way, but this is politics. And uh, I think, you know, you talk about, oh, the neighborhood's changing a little bit, and it becomes like, oh, you know, the guy liked it when there were more hippies, you know, or, or whatever. And when you talk about crime in your building, because you don't know who it is, it's a different thing. Yeah. Listen, any time to, any time to cops go out and organize a neighborhood watch yeah. group, the first thing they tell you is the best way to prevent crime is to know your neighbors. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How the hell are you supposed to do that when they're changing every three nights? Yeah, exactly. I've noticed really abysmal coverage in the Chronicle, but the examiner has actually been informative. Yes, very good. Yeah. What can we look for going forward when we hit the elections? Where, is there any Ron Conway going to squeeze the examiner? What's, uh, that'd be, that's an interesting question. I, I, I have no idea. We, we'll have Tim. Uh, I'm pretty sure, and although, <laughs> although Ron may come and visit you. Ron may come and visit me. He may, yeah. Uh, uh, and then you can earn more in a day than he earns. I know. Well. <laughs> if he comes to visit me, you better bring a pretty big check. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I somehow think Ron isn't coming to visit me. When we read on 48 Hills that Ron Conway is the most misunderstood man in San Francisco, <laughs> yeah. you'll know that we he's giving know. Me yeah. Well, no. Right. So is there, is there any sleaze coming down the pike about these B corporations while we're at it? The benefit corporations, they have, they have like a non-profit built into them and they're main office for doing it is at the end of the old I don't know. It's a discussion for another night, and it's nine o'clock, and some of us have to get going. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a discussion for another night. Thank you all very yes. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Of course. Tuesday. I will be there Tuesday at three o'clock. I will call you beforehand. Hello again. Hello again. Would you like to add?